Hello and welcome to Nicole Reacts, a show in which I, Nicole, react to online marketing gurus that I find on the internet. My qualifications for snark and commentary are that I've owned a marketing company for the last 15 years. In that time, I've worked with hundreds of clients on marketing strategy and implementation. So everything from someone comes to a two or three hour workshop of mine to at least one client I can think of that we've worked with for over a decade and everything in between. So stick around if you want to learn about marketing, I think in a fun way. On this series, we look at gurus in their training. So like people who say they're great at marketing and have either podcasts or talk on stage about it. I break down what they're saying and tell you whether I think it's accurate or not based on my real experience with marketing small businesses like myself. So stick around if you like that sort of thing. There's a whole playlist called Nicole Reacts on the Breaking Even Communications YouTube channel. And if you go on our company website, breakingeveninc.com, click on the blog area, there's a Nicole Reacts category in the blog as well that has much of the same content, pretty much the exact same content, actually. It's just sometimes it's easier to group it all together like that. I am audio only today for a variety of reasons, but mainly because the idea of getting on camera just really stresses me out right now. I have had some stressful things going on in, in mainly my work life. Uh, I just want to sit in my pajamas, not worry about makeup, and talk about marketing stuff. Here's hoping this is okay. If you like this sort of thing, feel free to leave a comment. If you don't like it, you can also leave a comment. So today's person is Donald Miller. And Donald Miller is an author who has a company called Story Brand. So helping to tell your company story. But he wrote a book that I've read a couple of times called Scary Close. He's religious. And he's a middle-aged white guy, like a lot of these people are, T-cells, courses and all of that. And what was really interesting is I know he has a podcast with Story Brand called Business Made Simple with Donald Miller. It's in the HubSpot Podcast Network, which is the same podcast network that Amy Porterfield is in. I'll link to my Amy Porterfield episode. In case this is your first episode, what you'll notice is that all of these gurus, besides being amazing at marketing, they're all connected to each other. So they all build off of each other's platforms, which is something that you and I as normal people don't get to do. So just keep that in mind as you're listening to someone and think they're amazing at marketing, look at their circle and see if they've been platformed by other people, because that certainly can help you build your audience faster. And I say this as somebody who the only reason I'm now monetized on YouTube is because of DC. I'll link to her channel right now, but basically I did a live stream with her and she got her subscribers to help me get my watch hours up and my subscribers up high enough to monetize. Being successful is about knowing people and these people definitely take advantage of that. So if you're wondering as a normal person why your podcast doesn't get millions of downloads or something like that, it, it helps to have friends in high places. So Donald Miller, as I said, he's written some books. He has this podcast. He has the story brand company. I was looking for something kind of juicy about marketing that we could listen to on this podcast, because even though this is a, a marketing podcast, supposedly, a lot of these people, they might start off as marketers and they eventually get into business advice. For example, there's an episode in this playlist called how to be a business consultant there's another one about how to sell your business for a lot of money, that kind of thing. So I feel like that's kind of veering away from marketing. So I wanted to find something that was marketing specific to react to. So I found this episode. It's from March 13 of this year, 2023. It's episode 115, how to turbocharge your marketing engine and generate more cash flow. It has the word marketing in it, but it has money in it too. And I think that's how a lot of these people stay interesting, right? Because every business, every person wants to make more money. So if you put that kind of in the titles, that definitely helps things. So runtime is almost 26 minutes. And before we get started, I want to let you know that I went to Tapa Podcasts and I clicked on the podcast page for this episode. And I got brought into this sales page about getting an offer. And there was no like show notes or anything on it. So then I typed in business made simple into a search engine. And I clicked on the business website. And again, I clicked on the podcast area and was taken to this page where I was supposed to buy something. So I had to go on Spotify to get to this episode so I could play it and actually read the show notes. So to me, that's weird. I understand wanting to sell someone something, but if I'm just trying to get to the show notes of a podcast, I shouldn't have to go on an expedition to do it. Anyway, let's hear what Donald Miller has to say about turbocharging our marketing engines. 
I want you to actively pursue the goal of doubling the revenue of your small business. Well, okay. I think most small businesses are trying to make more money. I feel like this is a bit of a stretch depending on where what stage of business you're at but at least he's not asking us to 10x our business am i right now why would you want to double the revenue of your small business your business is doing okay why get greedy let me tell you why you want to actually make an aggressive plan to grow your business the reason is 65 percent of small businesses die within the first 10 years so the idea of doubling your business is not just about doubling the amount of revenue that you bring in, it's also about staying alive because if you aren't actively trying to grow your business, there's a good chance you're not going to have a business for much longer. If you're not growing, you're dying. Rachel Hollis. Although she probably got that quote from somebody else now that I think about it. But anyway, I think it's interesting that he's assuming that someone listening to this podcast is a beginner business owner, that they've been in business less than 10 years. I'm listening to this as someone who's been in business for 15 years, thinking that I have ways that I can improve my marketing. But Maybe he is just assuming that people listening to a podcast called Business Made Simple are probably not advanced to business owners, but I don't know. I don't know about that assumption. I'm just going to say that. You need a clear message because without a clear message, your marketing just isn't going to work. And there's two things that you need to do in order to optimize your small business marketing. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Great. With that, I want to welcome you to the Business Made Simple podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. This is the only podcast. So we're about a minute in at this point, actually exactly one minute in. And I'm going to start keeping track. We haven't started yet. We just heard what the podcast is going to be about and why we need to care about it, which is that most businesses die. And if we're not growing, we're dying. So I'm going to keep an eye on the timestamp, but feel free if you're playing at home to guess at what minute mark he starts the actual content. So again, it is 26 minutes long. We're a minute in. So go ahead and place your bets. My bet is going to be at the six minute mark is when we're actually going to start that coaches you through a six-step plan to grow your small business. We do that by helping you build your business like an airplane. The cockpit is your leadership. The body is your overhead. The right engine is your marketing. The left engine is your sales. The wings are your products, and the fuel tanks are your cash flow. If and the mitochondria are the powerhouse to the cell. If you master the six <laughs> parts of a small business, your business will fly far and fast. Every week, you can... I love a good metaphor, but this is a lot to keep track of verbally. I'll be honest with you. Get the insight and steps you need to grow your business. I'm your host, Donald Miller. Marketing Against the Grain, hosted by Kip Bodner and Kieran Flan. So this is an advertisement for another podcast, okay? So we haven't started yet. And again, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. If you want to know what's happening right now in marketing, what's ahead, and how you can lead the way Marketing Against the Grain is the podcast for you. In each episode, Kip and Kieran share their marketing expertise, unfiltered in the details, the truth, and like nobody tells it to you. Here's a great episode you should check out right now. It's six AI tools that will save you one hour per day. Kip and Kieran share six AI tools that will transform the way you work while helping to scale your business to the next level. Learn how these tools will up-level you and your team with the power of AI through file organization, content marketing, memorizing your online search, and more. You can listen to Marketing Against the Grain wherever you get your podcasts. So every time there's a change in content, right, they do an audio change. So I have a feeling this could be another ad because the music has changed. Hey, it's podcast producer Bobby Richards, and I'm super excited because our new book, how to Grow Your Small Business is available. Okay, now we're selling a book again. This is the Podcast Network, so we are two and a half minutes in. Starting today. That's right. It came out today. And if you haven't ordered your copy of How to Grow Your Small Business yet, that's okay. If you do it right now, you'll be able to access an exclusive launch day bonus. It's the 10X Business Growth Plan, and you'll only be able to access this amazing tool through the end of the week. The 10X Business Growth Plan will give you an inside peek at what it looks like to 10X your small business without. It's like all of these business people have co-opted the 10X thing. Yeah, if you do 10 times more of something than the average person, you're going to get more results. But A, can you sustain that? And B, will you get 10 times the results? Maybe not. You'll get more results, but it might not be equivalent to the amount of effort that you put in. 
And the example I can think of for my own life is if you look at the Breaking Even blog, it has ranged from being a once a week blog to, and at, at, I think for five years or four years, it was daily. So I wrote this blog daily for a period of time. And what I noticed is when I cut down from daily on the blog to three times a week, I was still getting 80% of the traffic for doing about half of the work. So I was like, okay, it's worth me spending a little less time on the blog and doing more billable work because I'm still getting a good amount of traffic and the amount of traffic I'm losing is not worth the effort that I'm putting in to blog every single day. So I think that it's important to think of things that way. And I'm really curious whether Grant Cardone did the 10X thing and everyone's co-opting it or whether this started from somewhere else, like the origins of 10X. I'm very curious about, oh, you know what? I'm going to look it up real quick. Please appreciate Google auto-filled. I wrote, where did 10X? And then it typed in for business come from. 10X originally goes back to the Apollo program and the first moon shoot. To realize the project, engineer required the rockets to be 10X better. And with this request, a lot of groundbreaking innovations came up. So the 10X thing isn't even from Grant Cardone. It's from the race to the moon in the 1960s. So sometimes I'm like, do these people even have an original thought or do they just co-opt stuff from other places and sell it to another audience? I don't know, but okay. So this book about 10X, okay. We'll go back to the ad here. Burning out yourself, burning out your team and even risking the overall health of your small business. So if you want a blueprint on how to create fast yet sustainable growth, you'll find that in the 10X business growth plan, but it's only available through the end of the week. So order how to grow your small business and get that bonus now at growyoursmallbusiness.com. Let's create false urgency. And so I typed in growyoursmallbusiness.com. It redirects to a business made simple page, the same page that it directed me to when I tried to go to the show notes. And I can still get the bonus guys. Six months later, I can still get the bonus. It's not only available the week that they uploaded this podcast. So oh, I hate this false urgency stuff, but all right, we're three minutes and 20 seconds in. All right. You've been hearing me say your business works like an airplane for a long time. I think we're in the actual content. I think this is Donald Miller because there's no music in the background, but I'm not quite sure. So if so, we're at the three minute, 30 second mark. We are spending seven weeks in a row going through every part of that. Last week, we talked about your leadership and how your mission statement needs three economic objectives. If you have not listened to that episode. Okay, I'm still counting this as advertising because it's, oh, you're listening to this podcast? Go listen to this other one. Go back and listen to it. Okay. And today we're going to talk about the marketing, which is your right engine of the airplane. Let me tell you, though, what you're getting out of these seven episodes. Okay, we're selling the series of seven episodes, but... It's interesting that sort of auditorily, right, he's implying that there, this is a multi-part thing and that we're partway through it. But if you look at the title of the podcast, it says it doesn't say anything about this is like part four out of seven or something. And if I look in the show notes, it doesn't mention that this is part four out of seven or whatever part it's, it is. And it's not linking to the other parts either. If you're going to do a series, I think it's important to link back and forth. Like when I do a two part series on the cold reaction and I post part one in part two, I make sure in the show notes that part one and two link to each other so that you can get back and forth. And in the title, I say, this is part one. This is part two. Sometimes I even give a summary in part two of what was in part one in case you don't watch it. There's ways of, of doing a series of content to make sure people can get back and forth between the different parts. And none of that seems to be happening here. You're getting the plan that I used to double my business four times over. And the plan, the exact same plan, I'm going to use to double it again and probably double it again. And by that, he's I, very confident. One to two million, two to four million, four to eight million, eight to 16. We actually hit 16.5. And now we're trying to go from 16.5 to 27 million. You say, Dom, those numbers are astronomical. I don't even understand how I could ever get there. That's exactly what I thought. I mean, I would listen to a guy like me talking about those kinds of numbers and I would just think there's no possible way. And, uh, and what, seven years later, those are the numbers that we're hitting. Humble brag, humble brag, humble brag. I thought I would look up the size of story brand. I thought this would be a very straightforward question because when you start talking about $20 million, if you're a company of four or five people, it might be hard for you to produce that amount of work. Like you might need a staff of sorts. 
there's a website that is coming up when I look up story brand company size on Google called Zipia. And it says that story brand is a media company based in Nashville with 116 employees and an annual revenue of 4 million. And 4 million sounds like a lot less than 20 million, <laughs> like a fair bit less. And then on LinkedIn, it says that the company size is between 11 and 50 employees. Here's the thing with a privately owned company, basically you can say whatever you want because we can't prove or disprove it because these numbers aren't listed anywhere. If this was a nonprofit, they'd have to do annual reporting, which we could look up. And if this was a publicly traded company, they would have to report to shareholders and prove how much. But if there's a singular company owner, in this case, Donald Miller, or in the case of my company, me, there is no way for you to really be able to tell how much money is coming in to a business. So he can say it's 20 million, but we don't have any kind of proof of that. And the places online that I'm looking don't seem to think that money is coming in. So just going to say that here. In order to do that, though, you have to build an operation that is predictable, dependable. You have to have the systems and processes in place so that your company runs like a machine. So that if you go off on vacation for three weeks, you come back and the company has grown, not shrunk. It's not too dependable on you. I think this is a little silly. All of these kind of business gurus all want you to scale your business and have it grow and have you be completely absent from it and yet still making money. And I don't think that has to be true for your business to be quote unquote successful. My dad always said that a business runs differently when the owner's there. And I agree with that. I think it's important for the people I work with to see that I'm working on my business and that I care about it and I care about them, and I'm there to help them if something comes up. So I'm not saying don't take any vacations. I'm saying that expecting your business to grow while you're gone for three weeks, I think is, I don't know, not necessary. I would expect if I had to be gone for three weeks that people could maintain, like they could keep our clients happy. They'd be able to check my email. They'd be able to deal with issues and all that. But I wouldn't expect that they would be growing the company necessarily while I was gone. If you're happy running your business and you're like a hands-on owner, I feel like that's a good thing and not a bad thing. All of that has to take place. So you are on the third episode of seven episodes that cover an aggressive. Okay. Third of seven. I forgot what part I guessed it was, but I'm not sure why he didn't mention it in the title or show notes so that I would know to go look for the other parts before listening to this part. But I have a feeling we'll be able to jump right in. i correlates with my book how to grow your small business, go pick that book up. Today, we're going to talk about marketing. That is the right engine of your airplane. And there's two things that you need to do in order to optimize your small business marketing. Okay. So this whole time, he's got small multi parts. We've got the airplane analogy. We're at five minutes and seven seconds. First is clarify your marketing message. Now, that's what this company's built on. Our story brand framework, you're probably listening to this podcast. Because of the story brand framework, it's a framework that helps you clarify your marketing message into seven sound bites that you use and repeat over and over on your website, your landing pages, your lead generators, your emails. If you are not familiar with the story brand framework, go grab my book, Building a Story Brand, and become familiar with it. You need a clear message because without a clear message, your marketing just isn't going to work. You can't just have a pretty logo and pretty brand colors and expect to make money. People buy your products because they read or heard words that make them want to buy them. And if you're not saying those words clearly, you're passing up opportunity at the cash register. So if you want to read his book, go ahead and do that. But another thing you can do is you can basically write what I call a branding sentence. I think other people have called it that too. I didn't make it up. And it's a, a simple one sentence description of what your business does. And you basically take this template and you fill it in with your own stuff. And this is the template. And I will put it in the show notes too so that you don't have to remember this as I'm saying it. So our company helps our customer do something by providing something so they can have this outcome or benefit. So let me do this example for one of our co-working spaces. So Anchor Space Bar Harbor helps tourists and local business people in Down East Maine get their work done by providing affordable professional and accessible office and meeting space so they can be more productive simple to the point 
So as you see there, it's got it all, right? It's got my target demographic. It's got my core offering. It's got my market differentiators. And it's got a reason that someone would buy my product, right? It's all in this one sentence. Anchor Space Bar Harbor helps tourists and local business people in Down East Maine get their work done by providing affordable, professional, and accessible office and meeting space so they can be more productive. And you could take, like I said, this sentence that I'll, like I said, put in the show notes, and you can write this for your business. And for me, when I first did this, my sentence was way too long. And so writing this sentence and having it be a sentence I could actually say forced me to get at the essence of what we offer. Because it's easy to get in the weeds, right? It's easy for me to, to tell you like, oh, we have a co-working space and we have memberships. And sometimes people can come in for an hour and rent the meeting room or sometimes people come in on a regular basis. And it's just, it's too much, right? It would be really clear if I was stuck in an elevator with someone and had to explain my business, I'd be able to do it before we got to our respective floors by saying who we serve, what we do, and why it's valuable in a very succinct way. So it's a good exercise, even if you've been in business for a while. Like I said, it, I find it easy to get in the weeds of specifics and what we do and features and all of that. But if you can boil down your business to the essentials, it's a lot easier to market it. You're not making as much money as you could. However, we've talked about that a great deal on this podcast. There are entire episodes devoted to that. In fact, you were so interested in the story brand framework and clarifying your message and all things marketing that we created a spinoff podcast called marketing made simple that Dr. JJ Peterson hosts. And oh, okay. I was wondering, I saw the marketing made simple podcast and it seemed co-branded with this one, but I hadn't heard of the other guy. I heard of Donald Miller though. I think that this is interesting because I read his book, scary close. It's one of his books. And in that book, there's a lot of sort of Christian tones to it. He mentions going to church. He mentions uh, being Christian. He talks about seasons of life. And so there's all these either direct mentions of Christianity or even indirect kind of signals to his Christianity in the book. And what I don't understand is it seems like he's very focused on making the most amount of money possible. And I'm wondering to what end, like how is it Christian to double your profits for your business indefinitely, unless you were doing it for a reason. You know, if you said, Hey, I'm raising money to build a children's hospital, or I'm raising money so that I can send it to this other place so that they can build a school or I, making money for the sake of making money doesn't seem particularly Christian to me. So if it's unfair of me to say that, please let me know in the comments. But I, it's curious to me that sort of making more money for the sake of money seems to be first and foremost on his mind. So plenty out there about that. What I want to talk about today, though, is what to do with your clear message, because I think this is where most people drop the ball. They actually clarify their message using a story brand script, and then they don't do anything with it. It's almost like if we clarify our message, business will come. It won't. If you clarify your message and then say that message to the public so that their ears hear it, that's the only way to grow your business. Okay. And what do I mean by that? You've got to create a sales funnel and you've got to put your marketing messages, your very clear message inside of that sales funnel. Ah, uh, sales funnels, that old chestnut. I want to walk you through several things that you can create that will dramatically increase the revenue that your business brings in. And if you haven't done these things, I'm excited for you. Because if you haven't done these things, it is low hanging fruit. These are easy things to do. They're going to make you a truckload of money. Easy things, truckload of money and telling us in less than 20 minutes how to do them. All right, Donald Miller, you're setting my expectations high. Now, if you've already done the things that I'm talking about, do them again. Okay. Uh, so it's like if, if I do these things and I'm not wildly successful, like it's still my fault a little bit, right? And <laughs> you can do that. You can take me from two different angles when I say do them again. Make your existing sales funnel better and sharper or keep running your existing sales funnel and create another parallel sales funnel that uh, sells a different product or, oh or highlights a different revenue stream. It's funny because I've never done a funnel training and I keep threatening to do one. I have this picture of doing it in the new conference room when it's set up and having this whole persona. But the reality is, is say a sales funnel is just the fact that your customers or potential customers are at different stages of consideration for your product. 
these people talk about sales funnels like they're these highly targeted, amazing things. But the reality of a sales funnel is just that you offer something for free. People give you their email and then you market to them for a while and then eventually get them to buy something. That is essentially what a sales funnel is. So for example, if I want people to come to my local co-working space, I make a ebook called how to promote an event in Bar Harbor, Maine. And it's a list of things I do every time there's an event, how we promote it. And I make it available for free download if someone gives the email address. Once I have the email address, then I can give them a series of marketing messages. Maybe I run ads, whatever. Once you have someone's email address, there's a lot of possibilities. And eventually the idea is by continuously keeping in touch with them in some way, typically through emails, but maybe through something else, they'll eventually buy something. They downloaded my free ebook about how to run an event in Bar Harbor. Maybe they decide, you know what? I'm going to come to a workshop. I'm going to pay 25 bucks and come to an in-person workshop at Anchor Space. After they come to the workshop, maybe they say, wow, I love this. I'm going to buy a membership for $199. There's like a progression. So the idea of with the funnel is that you capture contact information and you market to them in a progressive way. So that's a funnel. These people hammer home the marketing funnel when A, it's not that hard. I just explained it to you in two minutes. And B, that some businesses don't need a marketing funnel. If you're an electrician, you don't need a funnel because you just need people to be aware of your business. And then when there's an electrical issue or when they're putting cool lights outside on their porch or something, they're going to give you a call. So some businesses don't even require funnels. So this, this artificial inflation of the importance of a sales funnel is so interesting to me, in particular when it's a podcast that's theoretically aimed at a lot of different kinds of businesses. But let's get back to it. All right, here's what you need in order to create a really great sales funnel. You need a one-liner. That's step one. A one-liner is one sentence that you can use to pique people's curiosity so that when somebody says, what do you do? You say this sentence and they pull out their credit card or they ask for your business card. They are very clear about what you offer and they understand whether or not they need it and maybe they even make a decision to buy it. So the first part of it is start with their problem. Second, position your product as the solution to that problem. Third, paint a picture of what life can look like if the customer buys your product. And that's it. Stop talking. Don't keep writing. Commas are not your friend. This is not a run-on sentence. If somebody asks me what I do anymore, where Business Made Simple is gone, I say 65% of small businesses fail and they don't have to. It's because most small business owners don't know how to run a business. I have six frameworks that help them build their business the right way so it makes a ton of money and they don't crash. So you that sounds like three sentences and not one sentence. Either that or if it was one sentence, it would be a run-on sentence. Okay, so I'm going to read to you the three sentences that are on this sales page that the podcast sent me to and that URL at the beginning of the episode where they said go here and download it and it's only available for a week. So this is what it says on this page. Don't stay trapped in the day-to-day -day of your business. How to grow your small business will give you a proven six-step plan for growth the making your first million video series with your purchase. So there's two buttons after that. It says order now or claim bonus. I'm guessing order now is where you pre-order the book and the claim bonus is you click that button once you've ordered the book and you put in your order number or something to prove you purchased it so that you get the making your first million video. This isn't Shakespeare here, guys. You just tell people what they're going to get. And if you want to write an emotional appeal, don't stay trapped in the day-to-day -day of your business. Like that's fine. But I personally, I like to empower people. I like to say, hey, y your business has more potential and you know it. Or grow your business so you can grow your impact in your community. Something like that. My headlines aren't necessarily perfect or anything. I guess what I'm saying is if you see those two headlines, that's a person who feels empowered that clicks on the order now button. Not a person who feels like they're trapped. I guess I don't like to make people feel like shit to buy something for me. I don't have a $20 million business either, so there's that. But anyway. You wouldn't know after I make that statement, Don Miller coaches small business owners. And uh, if they don't want to crash their business, they should hire him. Now, 
in the old days, if you'd have said, Don, what do you do? I was like, yeah, it's complicated. I, I was a memoirist for years. I lived in Portland, Oregon. So he like started off life as a writer. And as somebody who parlayed writing skills into a marketing career myself, I feel like this is a pretty normal path. I don't get what's complicated about that, but okay. Oregon. And by the way, the food scene in Portland, Oregon, let me tell you. I, in fact, the best biscuits and gravy I've ever had are in Portland, Oregon. You'd think they'd be in the South. They're not. There's a place called Mother's. Well, anyway, I used to hang out in coffee shops and I wrote memoirs, right? And uh, one of them took off. And then in order to, to write more books, I studied story and then I leveraged that into a, a marketing framework. And but yeah, nobody, everybody's going, Don's an interesting guy, but nobody's pulling out their credit card to buy anything from him. You see what I'm saying? And yeah, I guess getting to the point, if you answer someone's question in a meandering way, it's going to confuse them. That's where we get really freaking confused. So a one-liner is incredibly important. That is the most succinct marketing tool that you can get. You want to start with that. Then, yeah, you can start with a branding sentence even without even buying his book. The template I've used before is in the show notes. You actually want to wireframe a website that works. I'm not sure sure why he threw out the word wireframe here. The idea of a wireframe, if you're laying out something in web design, is it shows where elements are going to go on the page. So you might have a big box and be like, okay, an image is going to go here and it's going to take up half the page. And on the other half is going to be text. So the headline text is going to be maybe two lines long, and then there's going to be a little paragraph below it, something like that. So you put where content's going to go, if there's functionality, if you're going to have a search box or something, where that's going to go. And the idea is that it communicates sort of the structure of, of content and information and function without having to build the whole website just yet. So if there's multiple people that have to sign off on it or... If I wireframe the website and someone says, okay, let me find photos that are going to go in those spaces. And someone else says, oh, let me write the copy that's going to go in those spaces, right? It allows me to work with people a lot easier if they see where it's going. I'm not really sure why he brought up wireframing because I feel like this is something that you do, A, when you're an experienced designer or B, when you're communicating design to a group of people. If you're a small business owner and you need to put up a website, you're probably not doing the wireframing step. So I'm not really sure why you brought it up. Site needs to be an elevator pitch. As I scroll down your website, you are selling me on buying your product. Now, this is different than the way so many entrepreneurs and, and small business leaders create their websites. They create their websites and they create sort of a clearinghouse or a junk drawer of information about the company, how we got started, employment opportunities, what kind of products we sell, uh, where we make those products. That's lovely if you're a publicly traded company and you're dependent on shareholder value. It's great as a recruitment tool. It's terrible if you're trying to sell products. I don't think everyone puts that on their homepage. I think a lot of people, for example, for employment opportunities, they'll link the menu in the footer of their website. They'll have a sort of secondary menu. So there's the, the top navigational menu that's going to take you to like about or shop or contact. And then there's a sort of secondary menu in the footer that might be like terms and conditions, employment, that kind of thing. So I'm not sure if everybody's just dumping everything on the homepage. I think that's what he's talking about anyway. So why do 65% of small businesses fail? Well, there's plenty of reasons why. Yeah, there are plenty of reasons beyond marketing and beyond even who you are as a small business owner that could allow your business to fail. And I think a big one that nobody really acknowledges publicly is access to capital. So we all go through seasons in our business where money isn't coming in. And if you don't have a line of credit, if you don't have a relative who can loan you $10,000 or whatever... If people don't have those safety nets and something happens to their business where they need that, then they have to close. And it could even be something like maybe you use a raw material to make a product and there's a supply chain issue and suddenly the raw material you were buying costs double what you were paying for it. And so now you have to increase your prices or something and hope people continue to buy. A lot of these multi-million dollar business owners have a lot of privilege. They have a social network of people that's connected and that can introduce them to a high-end client. They have cash in reserve or people they know that will lend them money. They have a spouse who has a job so that they can carry 
the household while the business recovers. And those are the things that they're never going to acknowledge in a podcast like this, because not everyone has access to that. One of which they don't have one sentence that actually clarifies their offer. Two, they don't expand on that sentence in the form of an elevator pitch in on their website, on their landing page. So let me just give you the first four sections of a good landing page. The header. The header is at the very top. And, and here's what you're going to do with the header. You're going to answer three questions. What do we offer? How's it going to make our customer's life better? And what do they need to do to buy it? That's it. Get out. And he has that on his page. Don't stay trapped in the day-to-day -day of your business. This book has a proven six-step plan for growth. Order now. He's got that on his page. Totally. So he's following his own advice here. Out of there. Don't put anything else in your header. What do you offer? I need to know what the product is. I've gone to so many websites. I spent minutes, three minutes on their website, read all about their company, and I could not tell you what they do. I couldn't tell you what they sell. How does that happen? Some creative person who's really good with Photoshop, good with Illustrator, all that kind of stuff, they create a website and they assume that everybody going to that website knows what they offer. They don't, right? And, and even if they do, you want to clarify it and you want to repeat the message of come to us for this. Then I need to know how is this going to make my life better? If you're a roofer, it's going to save me money on roofing. It's going to last twice as long and it's going to it's going to save me money on my air conditioning bill. I need to know all of that in the header. Here's what we offer and here's what you get out of it. And then I need to know how to buy it. And so many people use passive aggressive language. Learn more, get started, stop it. Stop learn more and get started. What I want you to do is actually say, buy now. I love that he thinks learning more is passive aggressive. Of the buttons that Facebook offers in its advertising, the learn more button is one of the top two performing buttons in Facebook ads. Also, there's nothing wrong with someone wanting to learn more before they buy something. I don't think it's passive aggressive for someone to need more information before putting down their credit card. Or schedule an appointment, uh, schedule a call. Talk to one of our reps. Make an appointment today. You want something. You want to ask for the money all over your website. Oh, I call it the cash register. That buy now button is a cash register. You want it at least twice in the header of your landing page. Top right and dead center. So they've done eye tracking studies and stuff. And basically, in terms of where your eye goes first on a website or the typical person's, it's the upper right corner. And that's odd to think about because in English, we read left to right. So you think it would be the upper left corner, but no, we go upper right. And that's why you'll typically see the buy now button there or sometimes a search box or a little search icon because that's where your eye goes first. So we want people to be able to get to the place where they buy or to be able to find the information they're looking for. I'm not opposed to this advice, but I think two order now buttons before you even scroll on a desktop computer might be overkill in my opinion, but Again, I don't own a $20 million business, so there is that. Upright and dead center, a different color. I just like to not bother people. Button, by the way, bright yellow works better than any other color. Isn't that crazy? His button's kind of a coral color, so he's not using a yellow button. Bright yellow works better than any You say, why? Usually, it's a differentiated color. It stands out because you don't have a lot of bright yellow on your website. The other reason is quite simply, we're all used to shopping at Amazon and that's what the, that's what the add to cart button is on Amazon. Basically this idea that your buttons or links should be some kind of bright accent color or something like that to make them stand out of the pages is pretty standard web design practice. But if you want to actually test the whole yellow button versus another color button thing for yourself, there's a way for you to do that. It's called an AB test. And what you do is you can get this third party software for your website that will allow you to run a test. And what you wanna do is you wanna only test one variable at a time. For example, we did some work with a gym recently and in one version of the page about an upcoming program, we put pricing on it and we copied the page and we just took the pricing off of it. And then we ran an ad to that page and we got like 150 people to look at that page. And on that page, on both versions, there was like a form that you filled out if you were interested in the program. And the page with the pricing converted better than the page without the pricing. Now, 150 something or however many people it was is a pretty small sample size. So we're running it again. We want to understand if people knowing the pricing is going to convert them or not. So I didn't change the page layout. I didn't change any of the other content. 
I just changed whether there was pricing or not on the page. So that's what you want to do if you're testing button colors. Just don't change the button text. Don't change any other content on the page. Just make it so that half of your visitors see yellow and half of them see another button color. You can run the experiment for, I don't know, a month or two, get some data, and you'll be able to see probably based on the data, whether it's a purchase, someone filling out a form, someone spending more time physically on the page, whatever it is that you're measuring as the success metric, you can see whether it worked or not. So just know that you can independently test this and it's not all yellow buttons or nothing. You might find that your customers convert better with a pink button or they convert better with a red button or they convert better with a green button. The reality is there's not like one simple rule of thumb that works for everyone. Otherwise, there would only be yellow buttons on websites, including Donald Miller's website, by the way. And this site does not have a yellow button on it. I bet he tested and maybe this button color did better than the yellow one. So rather than taking general advice, if you're not sure, test it for yourself and test it on your audience, test it on your business. It might work differently than it works for his. We're just programmed to click the bright yellow button and place an order as a tip for you for listening to this podcast. All right. So that's your header. Now that's the first date. And the first date, all you're trying to do is pique somebody's curiosity and, and get a second date. Let's scroll down. Let's get into the second date. The second date is stakes. Now this is the section right beneath the header. And I want you to go negative. I want you to explain every terrible, horrible thing that's going to happen if they don't buy your product. Now the header was hopefully positive. Here's what you get if you do buy my product. Here's what you lose if you don't. All right, let's follow this page. I, I'm going down below and it says, making your first million. In the making your first million video series, you'll get a blueprint for a small business growth, the five steps to making your first million, actionable tips you can start implementing right now. So there's nothing negative here. That sort of contrast is interesting. It's narratively interesting. The header is, here's where I can take you. And the second section is, here's what's going to happen if you don't come with me. And we've got a positive pull and a negative push. And they're happening in the first two sections of the website. You can do this a bunch of ways. Uh, you can say, you no longer have to struggle with. And then bullet point, leaky roof, high HVAC bills, gutters full of debris. Tell me what you're saving me from. And the other thing that I want you to include in the second section is the cash register. Schedule a call. Buy now. You're going to include that in the cash register. All right. So we've got the first two sections of our landing page. The third section of your landing page is going to be the plan. And the plan are the three steps that you might need to take in order to do business with me. The reason that you want to include three steps is you visually want the journey that you're going to take to do business with me to look easy. If I need a new roof, I've got all sorts of cognitive dissonance out of the gate. How much is this going to cost? How much time is this going to take? Are you going to be crawling around on my roof? What if we discover a bunch more stuff up there? I don't know if we have the budget for this. You know what? I'm going to deal with this next month. They probably are going to deal with it next month, but they might not have you in mind when they do, right? They might meet somebody at church who does roofs, and now that they're going to bounce off your website, they're going to do business with a guy at church. In order to keep their business, what you want to be able to say is, hey, don't pause. Don't wait. Don't think about it for a month. Take the first small step. Just take the first small step. I feel like replacing a roof will cost thousands of dollars. And I think rushing people into a multi-thousand dollar decision is gross. And I don't want to do it. Let's look at what the third section is on his page, though. So I scroll down and half of the page is him holding up his book called How to Grow Your Small Business. And it's a video that would play. And the other half of the page is this text. Most small business owners are trapped in the day-to-day -day of running their business. They're stressed, discouraged, and not confident in their plan for growth. If your business isn't growing, you'll never get to experience the life that you hoped for when you became a business owner. How to Grow Your Small Business will give you a proven six-step plan for growth so you can stop drowning in the details and spend more time doing the things you truly love in your business and your life. Okay, he's a good copywriter. I'll give him that. But... I don't see the three-step plan here. I do see that the text is divided into three sections. There's two line breaks making kind of three paragraphs, but I don't see the plan here of what's going to happen, except that I buy the book and then I get to spend time doing more of the things I love. But that's not a three-step plan to me. Step one, call us 
and let us give you a quote on what it's going to cost to do your roof. Second, we'll send a crew to replace your roof. The process for a 3,000 square foot home usually takes about a week. And third, I will come to your house personally to inspect the roof and make sure this is, in fact, a 30-year roof and you got everything that you need. Step one, two, three. Whenever we see those three steps laid out and it's all put very simply, we are much more likely to take a step. And I'll give them that. On my website, I could definitely be clear with how things work. I have a book, a consultation call link on the top of the page, but maybe I should be a little bit more clear of the process that we work with people. So good point, Donald. And think about what taking a step means. Calling you and getting a quote dramatically increases the chance that you're my roofer dramatically increases the chance that I'm going to get on your schedule and you're going to replace my roof and I'm going to, and we're going to exchange some money. Where if you don't actually make the first step a baby step, and the first step is, in fact, across the yawning chasm of me deciding that you're going to do my roof and commit to that, the chances of me taking that baby step are much greater than the chances of me jumping across this yawning chasm. So you, you just increase your orders with part three, the plan. Okay, part four... I want you to position yourself as the guide. And if you're familiar with the story brand framework, you know what this is. It's basically saying, I am the person who's going to help the hero save the day. And we've got a hero customer. They've got a leaky roof. And we want to position ourselves as the guide in the hero story. Don't position yourself as the hero. Position yourself as the guide in the hero story. I am the person who helps the hero get a new roof so that they live happily ever after in a home that is more efficient, you know, economically efficient, energy efficient, and also doesn't leak. The two ways that you position yourself as a guide are empathy and authority, empathy and competency. So you want to say some sort of empathetic statement. We understand choosing a roofer is a very big decision. A great deal can go wrong. We have helped over 7,000 families in our area get a new roof, and they all love it. We have a 97% satisfaction rating. What did I just do? I understand your pain, and I empathize it, and I know how to get you out of it. That one-two punch. And then, of course, you actually include the cash register, that buy now, schedule an appointment. Now, think about it. I just His fourth section on this page is a series of testimonials. Well, I'm not going to read the testimonials. I'm going to tell you who is leaving the testimonials. Ready? Tony Robbins, Amy Porterfield, Lewis House, John Lee Dumas, and Jenna Kutcher. I think I've reacted to three of these five gurus so far in this series. So, yeah, I don't see any small business owners in this testimonial list at all, which is interesting because it's aimed at small business owners. So you would think that he could show that, oh, Nicole's marketing company grew to $1 million in sales. You know, you think he'd be able to show that if his framework worked so well. Wireframe for you in this podcast, the top- Stop saying wireframe. It's not a wireframe. <laughs> four sections of your website. And you want to get started on that. If you want to increase your revenue, you want to get started on that. A wireframe is more about design and not just content. So wireframe is not the right word for this. All right. It's finally time to close out of spreadsheets with HubSpot CRM. You'll get. All right. So we've got an ad and I'm writing down at the 17 minute and 38 second mark. Real time data at your fingertips. So your teams stay in sync across the customer journey. Track your contacts and customers. Send personalized emails in bulk and get the context you need to create amazing experiences for your teams and your customers at scale, all from one powerful platform. It's why more than 150,000 companies already use HubSpot CRM to run their businesses better. Plus, HubSpot's user-friendly interface sets you up for success from day one, so you can spend less time managing software and more time on what matters, your customers. There's no better time to get organized. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better and get a special offer of 20% off on eligible plans at HubSpot.com slash business made simple. So HubSpot pricing is a little bit confusing. So what I did is I went to their pricing page and I clicked create a bundle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I want the starter marketing hub 
and marketing being to be able to probably send email newsletters and maybe text messages. I'm going to say that I have 3000 contacts. Okay. Cause they start with a thousand and then your price increases from there. And I think I have about 2,500 in my Google contacts and probably I'm going to meet people in the next year. I only apparently get charged for the contacts that I want to market to. So I can bring contacts in, but if I actually send them marketing messages, that's where I get charged. But let's just say I have 3000 and okay. So sales hub, I'm not quite sure what this is. I'm guessing sales is like the CRM. So let's say that I had a free consultation with you and now you're in my pipeline, right? And maybe someone's going to follow up with you, stuff like that. Although I'm not sure how that's different than a CRM. So I'm just going to stay starter with that one. And I'm going to say two paid users. So I'm going to pretend that me and Jessica are each going to have an account that we log into for that. Service hub, I'm guessing that's for people who are booking services. So maybe I have a calendar where people can book my time or something like that. So that's 20 bucks a month for the starter level. So I'll keep that. The CMS hub, I'm not quite sure how CMS is different than sales, but I'm going to keep that at 25 bucks a month. And I'm going to unclick operations hub because I don't quite know what that is. And then there's a bunch of add-on services and the lowest price one is $500 a month for inbound consulting where I get monthly sessions with an inbound consultant to look at my marketing. And the highest priced item here is the 4,500 monthly fee for a inbound consulting premium, which is a guided service developed by a consultant that will help me with my outcomes. And the service consists of up to 12 months of total support, which may include phone conversations, email-based support, prep work, and other activities related to your service. Let's just say I'm not gonna offer any of that. My current bill for HubSpot is $113 a month, billed annually. Now let's say that I don't have $1,300 kicking around right now. If I pay monthly, it goes up to $125 a month. So HubSpot is not an inexpensive service for small businesses. And what I think is hilarious is I just looked up Donald Miller's website to see if he's running in HubSpot and he is running in WordPress. And when I look up Amy Porterfield's website, who's the other person in the HubSpot network that we listen to a podcast from, her website, it looks like is partially running in HubSpot, but the actual e-commerce and blog sections are running in WordPress. So she's very partially running a HubSpot website. So even the people in their podcast network aren't using their software necessarily to its full extent. So I wanted to throw that out there. And now back to the show. All right. The next thing that you want to include in your sales funnel is a lead generator. A lead okay. That was about a one minute ad read. Just FYI. Lead generator is a PDF some sort of video series, some sort of information that people will give their email in exchange for. You've got to start collecting email addresses. I bet you 50% of people hearing my voice right now are not collecting email addresses. And I think it's key to doubling the revenue of your company. My I say some businesses, actually, text can be as effective. I'm trying to get a local eatery that I get food at to get a text messaging service because they always post their specials to Facebook and Instagram and I don't see them three quarters of the time. And I just want to know when they have the food that I like there so I can go there and get it before it sells out. So email I think is great for a lot of people, but texting service might work equally well depending on what kind of business you're in. Might be the number one thing that you can do to actually double the revenue of your company is start collecting email addresses. Email marketing works. It is not going to stop working. Text messages starting to work a little bit too. The amount of small businesses using text messaging services have increased a lot in the last couple of years. I think 50 something percent. I'll see if I can find a stat and I will put it in the show notes if I do. But I did read that somewhere. And I know that text messages also have a 90% open rate and a very high click through rate. And I will put some stats in the show notes proving this. So he says they're starting to work. No, I would say that they are solidly working for some businesses right now. Email marketing works. The return rate on the amount of money you spend on email marketing, the last study I saw was something like 4,000%. It depends on your industry. It depends on the value of your product. It depends on a lot of things. But email marketing does have a high ROI pretty much across the board. 4,000 freaking percent. I built my entire company 
on email marketing and you should too. We also have to understand that you might build a company differently in 2023 than you did 10 years ago. But yeah, I, email is going to work. I'm just saying, acknowledging that with the pace that technology is changing, you might go through the exact same steps you did 10 years ago to try to build a company and it might not work as well. So create a lead generator. And what's a good lead generator? Basically, you want to start to solve a problem in the territory that you own. So if you own roofing, you're going to come up with something like the what my new roof should cost calculator. I click that button. I enter the square footage of my home. I go outside. I count the number of peaks and valleys or whatever you want me to do. I've got one fireplace chimney that comes out of the roof and we're done. And then I choose, I want cedar shakes or I want steel or whatever I want on my roof and we're done. And then it spits out a number. This so if you're a small business and you don't want to make a calculator to calculate your services because it's complicated, I understand. I certainly couldn't make one for my business. What you could do maybe is a guide that says, okay, this is how you know you need a new roof. And you can include, you've probably taken pictures of roofs that you fix and stuff. You could show people like this is what you look for. This is what it's going to look like. These are the places you're going to you look for this kind of damage and help people just even evaluate that they need a new roof before a giant gaping hole is in their roof and water is pouring from their ceiling. You could do that too. So if a calculator sounds too complicated for you and you don't want to commit to a certain price point, there are other things that you can give people that are valuable that they will download and appreciate. This is approximately what you should pay. But I had to give you my email address to get that information. Anybody who uses a new roof calculator needs a new roof, right? Nobody goes and oh, have you played this awesome game? It's called the new roof calculator, <laughs> right? Let's pretend we have a 20,000 square foot home. Oh, did you see this? Nobody. I don't know. I think some people would do that. I might do it. I might be like, oh, I wonder how this calculator works and put in a bunch of different numbers. But maybe I'm just a nerd. Does that. You've got a qualified lead and you want to start, this is the next part. You want to start emailing them. Now you want to email them at least six weeks in a row preferably 12 and preferably 52, 52 consecutive weeks. Got it. Reason is, especially with something like a roof, there's a window of time in which they're going to deal with this problem. And you don't know where they are in this window. Their wife may have just come to them and said, Un, I was up in the attic today and there is a pool of water in the attic. And that may be step one. The customer's going to go put some duct tape on the roof and fix it. And then they're going to start thinking about the problem. And if they go to your website and you don't have a lead generator, then nine weeks from now, when there's a big rainstorm and they realize the duct tape's not going to work, they will have forgotten you. But think about what I just said. If they use the new roof calculator, you have sent them nine emails. Now, how amazing is that? Nine different times you have branded yourself inside of my subconscious at the point when I need a roof. I love how just like 10 minutes ago in this podcast, he was talking about basically making people buy right away. Don't think, just buy it. And now he's acknowledging that some purchases people need time to consider. So I think this is more realistic, in particular, if you have a quote unquote high ticket product. Like most people just don't spend $5,000 or whatever without thinking about it. I am definitely calling you. However, if you don't do that, nine weeks later, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to Google a local roofing company. And unless you have the SEO to show up on top, probably not going to find you. Let's back up. The other thing you can do is you can make a Google business listing for your roofing company. And you could have your customers leave Google reviews and fill it out as completely as possible. And so when someone looks at roofing company near me, if you have the Google business profile that is the most filled out and that has positive reviews and there's a list of other roofing companies that have no reviews or just a couple, you're going to stand out. So you don't have to necessarily worry about SEOing enough. If people are using search engines, you can make yourself stand out in search engines. Um, Bing also has Bing local and you can set up a, a Bing listing and you can have it sync with your Google listing. So when you fix the Google listing, it'll fix it in Bing. Just FYI there. Over 50% of searches are called no click searches where someone searches for information and it's served to them on the page without them having to click through on a website. 
So if your customers are looking in Google for your stuff, by all means, make a Google business listing, fill it out as completely as possible, and then ignore all the phone calls you'll get of people wanting to sell you Google ads. You just make a free listing and you will get hundreds of views a month. I think you'll be surprised. You have created your one-liner. You've wireframed a website that works. You've created a lead generator. I think Donald Miller learned the word wireframe recently or something. He seems very excited to use it. And now you're sending follow-up emails. That is called a sales funnel. And it works. It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. I, I am obsessed with helping you grow your business. There's nothing. I just got stopped. Oh, gosh. Where was I? It was yesterday. Uh, At the beginning, he talked about don't be a meandering storyteller. Just get to your point. <laughs> Here he is beginning to meander himself. I was at the grocery store and somebody pulled me aside and just said, hey, I don't mean to bother you. I don't want to be that guy. You have helped me make so much money. I literally left my job. I started a company. I was scared to death. And I just do what you say to do. And I've made so much money. That has that encouraged me so much because all these people come to you. I know what they're doing with it. They're being generous with it. They're paying for their kids' college. They're helping friends. They're employing people. It's just so awesome. And I'm telling you, I'm obsessed with this, but I can't help you if you don't make a sales funnel. I just can't. Okay. At if you don't want to make a sales funnel, I can help you. At the end of every episode, I give you a plan of action from today's coaching conversation. These are the main takeaways you can immediately implement to strengthen and grow your business. Today's plan of action is create a CRM. CRM stands for Customer Relationship Management. So he's acting like this thing is the action plan, but let's talk about the things he's having us do ahead of this action plan that actually are also work. Number one, we have to read his story brand book and follow his framework to come up with the seven things or whatever, right? The messaging. Number two, we have to relay out our entire website around his wireframe, his word, not mine. Then we have to make a free something that someone wants to download like a free roofing calculator or an ebook or something. And we have to make a system where people give their email addresses and they get the thing. Then we have to create 52, AKA weekly emails for a year that are going to go to these people as they sign up for the email list. But this is hours of work so far. Okay. And now he's saying, all right, this is your homework. I feel like I just have a bunch of homework already, but okay. HubSpot is a CRM. Keep. Do you know how much work it is to set up a CRM? Okay, let, let me just go through the steps with you. First of all, you have to organize your existing contacts, right? So for me, I've got some contacts on my phone. I've got some contacts in my Google workspace, my email, and I've got some contacts on social media. Okay, obviously, maybe I've got someone in my phone who's also in my Google workspace contacts, and I could just attach their phone number to them. So what I'm going to want to do is export my phone contacts, export my Google workspace contacts, and maybe I export my LinkedIn contacts. And maybe that's like the social network. That's the most like kind of relevant to this exercise. I'm going to combine all of those into a spreadsheet and I'm going to clean the duplicates and make sure people's information is up to date. Then I'm going to get CRM software, in this case HubSpot, and I'm going to import them in. And then what I have to do is assign what these people are to me. So is this person a marketing client? Are they a website client? Are they a potential client? I have to come up with categories and assign them. And then I have to think, okay, as I get new people, how do I make sure that they're going into my CRM? If I start, if I meet someone at a business networking event, they hand me a business card. Okay. What are my steps to making sure they get into my CRM? And I have to come up with procedures of how I'm going to follow up with them. There are people who do this for a living. It's not going to be this fast thing. I love how you casually mentioned setting up a CRM. Like you're going to wake up like on a Saturday morning and say, you know what? Today's the day I'm going to set up my CRM. And like, you're going to be done by the end of the day. I assure you, if you have any amount of contacts like I have, you are not going to be done at the end of a day. You're probably not even going to be done at the end of the week. He has given you a literal part-time job here. Him telling you to do it is quick, but you actually doing it is not quick. I'm just going to say that here. KEAP, formerly Infusionsoft, is a CRM. MailChimp is a CRM. Go to a CRM, and I want you to do this. I want you to set a timer for two hours, 120 minutes. Put it on your calendar. 
two hours. I just want you to play with it. Just play with it. Figure out how to create a lead generator that collects email addresses and then write a couple emails. Think of it as spending two hours playing around. Why? Because at the end of the two hours, you're going to have a CRM. This is so disingenuous. I'm actually angry. Him acting like in two hours, you're going to have set up your whole CRM is such bullshit. You've clearly never set up a CRM yourself if you think it's that quick. Not only are you going to have a CRM, you're going to know how to use one because they're not complicated. All, you're just intimidated because you, you've never done it. So it's not that it's a difficult concept. It's that there's a lot of steps before it's actually working. He's just acting like everything is going to go perfectly for you in the two hours that you're setting up a technological system that you've never set up before. He can say something like this because he is on a podcast. He is not dealing with a human on the other end of the phone calling him saying, hey, I listened to your podcast. I tried to do it in two hours and my import from my spreadsheet isn't working. Can you help? I'm doing that kind of work. So these gurus can stand on the mountaintop and act like something's easy. But when my clients try to do it and can't, I'm the one getting the phone calls. So when people like him act like something is easy, when there is people whose whole job it is to do this thing, just be cognizant of that, that he doesn't actually have to answer to anybody by saying this is easy. An actual person who's working with clients like I am is going to be the one who's resetting the client's expectations that no, it's actually not going to be two hours. It's actually going to take you longer. Oh, you actually didn't set this up entirely correctly. So your emails aren't going to send. Let me help you fix that. So then I look like the bad guy. I look like the one who's saying it's more complicated than you think, or it's going to cost you more money because I have to go in and fix it. I look like the bad guy. And this guy gets to just be like, oh, I have a $20 million business. It's only going to take you two hours to set this thing up. Ugh. And unlike video games that you play around with, where you get points, the sad, the very sad thing about playing around with the software at Keep is you don't get points. You get dollars. <laughs> you actually get dollars. And some of you are going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And do I get that you're going to make more money if your contacts are organized and you're keeping in touch with them on a regular basis. We all know that selling something to an existing client or customer is easier and less expensive than acquiring a new customer. I'm not saying it's not worth doing this. I'm saying telling people that it takes two hours to do this and that you're just going to make money once it's set up is not setting them up for success here. Dollars, you can go buy points if you want points. You're going to make money. I mean, there are, there's a point system. Business is a game. It's a very competitive game. And there is a point system. It's called your profit and loss statement. It's called your bottom line. And you're going to get lots of points if you look at it that way, if you use a CRM. If you actually want to understand five other ways that we can make you a ton of money, my new book, How to Grow Your Small Business, comes out tomorrow. Now, if you're listening to this on Monday when it came out, so is one of the six steps set up a CRM? Is that one of his six steps? If so, I don't disagree with it. But if each one of the steps is like a 40 hours or more thing to do, then yeah, if you put that kind of time into your business doing these kind of activities, it's going to do well. But the reason that most people don't have CRM set up is that there is an initial amount of work that goes into it. And then once you do have it set up, and you're paying $120 a month to HubSpot or whatever, you have to purposefully use this new tool to make sure that you're using it to its full capability and that you're using $120 a month effectively. And you also have to get your staff trained in how to use it. So if the six-step plan is a bunch of very big ideas like setting up a CRM, I can understand why you would make more money. If I give you six very involved steps in doing something, it's probably going to work. For example, hashtag not an expert, but let's say I said, okay, here's a six step tr body transformation plan. Step one, you're going to work out two hours a day. Step two, you're going to adhere to these very strict macros. Okay. That's only two steps, right? But the amount of time you're going to spend meal prepping managing how you're going to get nutrients throughout the day and finding two hours a day to work out, you're going to have a part-time job basically building your body. Is it going to transform? Probably. Do you have four hours a day to work on this? Probably not. I know this podcast is called Business Made Simple, 
but just saying something that will take someone literally hours to do in a certain amount of time every day to maintain is not necessarily simple, in particular if somebody's already very busy. I want it to be true as much as you do, okay? I want it to be true that we can spend an hour a day and make a million dollars. I do. If you're a client or a potential client and you think somehow you're a failure because you haven't done these things, I'm telling you as someone who does this for a living, this is hours of work. And him just telling you to do it is only simple for him. Comes out tomorrow. If you're listening to this after it came out, it's out. You can actually go to Amazon.com and you can pick up how to grow your small business today. The reality is nobody starts a business in order to run a business. That's never happened. Not a single person has ever started a business because they were so excited about running a business. They started a business because they love the product. They started a business because they started noticing there was a problem in the marketplace that they could solve. They started a business because they wanted freedom. They started a business because they wanted to make more money. There's many reasons to start a business. But nobody actually started it because they wanted to run one. Therefore, they get into it and they don't know how to run one. And so 65% of them fail. There's reasons for failing besides that they don't know how to run a business. Listen, I believe in knowing what you're doing to start a business, but I'm telling you that I know people with MBAs who have failed businesses and I have a geology degree and I run a business. I'm not saying it's not worth learning about running a business and continuing to learn as you run it. But even if somehow you knew everything about running a business, that would not necessarily mean that your business is going to be successful because there is so many things that are outside of your control that will determine if your business is successful or not. 65% of them crash. I teach you how to run a business easily and simply in this book, How to Grow Your Small Business. Again, I love these episodes where I know that we are helping you grow your small business. So I know that we're helping you make a lot more money. Uh, next week, we're going to keep doing the same thing. I think it's as good as this week's episode, but we're going to keep growing your business. Make sure to listen next week. Thanks as always for listening to the Business Made Simple podcast where we help you build your business like an airplane so you can fly far and fast. Next week, I'll show you step three to doubling your revenue. See you then. I thought we were in step three, but okay, let's do some calculations here. We had six and a half minutes of ad read for the 26 minute episode. So we had five and a half minutes at the beginning of, of sort of ad and, and general lollygagging. And then we had a one minute ad read in the middle. So that means that this episode was 25% advertisement to 75% content. Do I think Donald Miller knows what he's talking about? I think he does. He runs a content marketing company. So I, I would say he knows about marketing. But what I don't like about people who are marketing gurus is I understand that they want to make this sound doable to the small business owner, but they need to also prepare them for the amount of work it's going to be and how to troubleshoot issues. Let me use an analogy. On HGTV, when they do the home renovation specials, it's a half hour show. And there's usually a part at the beginning where you meet the homeowner and then they do something like they take a sledgehammer and they help demo the wall. And then you know how there's a part in the middle where you see 45 people working overnight and there's people coming in and out of shot and it's a time lapse and it's sped up. That's 80% of the work. And as a society, we don't talk about the 80% of the work part of doing something, whether it's renovating a house or building a website. I understand that as a society, that 80% of the work in the middle is boring and we don't want to watch it, but it also has to happen for the reveal to come at the end. So someone like Donald Miller is just doing the beginning 10% part where he's, here's our plan and here's what we're going to do. And then he's saying that part in the middle is going to take you two hours of playing around. And I just think that is really setting people up to feel like crap when A, it takes them longer than two hours. Or B, something goes wrong. It's supposed to be easy. Why is something going wrong for me? And what happens is practitioners like me who actually work with small businesses end up working with these people and helping them through it. Now, I don't want you to think listening to this that I mind at all helping a small business owner do that 80% of the work part at all. I, I don't. But what makes me mad is people like Donald Miller making $20 million off of telling someone that what I do is easy and not actually doing it themselves. And if for some reason Donald Miller is listening to this, Donald Miller, 
if you ever do some show where I can watch you build a CRM in two hours of playing around, I would watch the crap out of that. I'm not going to pay you anything for it because you have $20 million and I don't, but I, I, I would watch that. Please tell me that's happening. So thanks so much for watching. If you like this sort of content, you can check out the Nicole Reacts playlist on the YouTube channel, or you can go to breakingeveninc.com slash blog and get to the Nicole Reacts category and see all the episodes there. If you want to lightly keep in touch, we have an email newsletter. It goes out once a month. If you go to breakingeveninc.com slash newsletter, you can check out samples of past issues of the newsletter and put in your email to get future ones. And because Donald Miller wants me to ask for the sale, I'm going to here. If you're looking for a marketing firm that will work collaboratively with you on your business ideas, let's talk. We do a no obligation 30 minute consultation, which you can book right on our website. And we can talk about ways that we can work together, learn more about your business and see if it's a good fit all around. So thanks so much for watching, or I guess listening today. And remember, the marketing gurus will just keep on coming. But the good news is you've got a friend and that's me in the marketing business that's going to call them on all their bullshit and not make you feel bad that something takes you a while to do. Marketing's not easy, but I think it is fun and I appreciate you spending time with me today. Take care and I'll see you next video.